your T3 level is probably the single most important measure of thyroid function, even more important than the TSH. Why? Because it represents the amount of active thyroid hormone that is available for use in your body. The more of it you have, the better you will feel. This then begs the question, can you personally do anything to improve your T3 status? The answer to this question is absolutely. And today we're going to be talking about how to do just that with the use of some natural treatments. First on that list is the use of supplements like zinc and selenium. There are a ton of different supplements that you can use to support your thyroid, but few are going to be better at improving T3 than zinc and selenium. In a world where the soil is depleted of natural nutrients, and in a world where we often eat processed foods which are devoid of these essential minerals, there is a very high chance that you aren't getting enough of either of them. And available research supports this idea. According to the data, approximately 20 to 40% of hypothyroid patients don't have enough zinc, and approximately 30 to 50% of thyroid patients don't have enough selenium. This means that about 4 out of 10 people listening to this right now do not have enough of either of these. And that's a problem because both of them act as essential cofactors for the enzymes that help your body turn T4 into T3 thyroid hormone. If you are deficient in either of them, these enzymes will still work, but they will work less efficiently. In a practical sense, what this means is that your body will still create some T3, but it will create less than it needs to. How big of an impact are we talking here? It depends depends on the person, but it can range from mild to severe. To illustrate this, we can look at some studies. One in particular looked at hypothyroid women who were also overweight and found that if they also had low zinc and they replaced it with supplements, they saw an increase in their free T3 and a drop in their TSH. The only catch here is that in order to obtain these prothyroid benefits, you must first be zinc deficient. In other words, if you have enough zinc and you take more zinc, you're probably not going to see this benefit to T3. But given that there's such a high percentage of thyroid patients who are zinc deficient, taking it will likely provide some benefit. If you determine that you are somebody who should be taking either zinc or selenium, here's what you need to know. If you're using zinc, make sure you look for zinc as zinc chelate, zinc monomethionine, zinc gluconate, zinc acetate, or zinc citrate. Avoid all other forms as they are inferior to those I just mentioned. As far as dosing is concerned, you only need about 5 to 15 milligrams in any one serving. Higher doses will not be absorbed and they only increase your risk of GI-related side effects. If you're going to take selenium, look for selenium as selenomethionine or as selenium glycinate complex. As far as dosing is concerned, you only need around 50 to 150 micrograms per serving. Some people will advise that thyroid patients take higher doses than this, somewhere in the range of 400 to 500 micrograms per day, but these higher doses increase your risk of selenium toxicity and are not needed. And by the way, if you're going to take zinc or selenium, you might as well take them together, since a deficiency in both often coexists. If you want to see a supplement that contains both, you can check out the link in the description. The second thing you want to do is to improve your gut health. As a thyroid patient, you should care a lot about your gut health for one important reason. Approximately 20% of T4 to T3 conversion occurs there. This means if you have any sort of intestinal problem, your ability to create T3 in the gut will be compromised to some degree. This impairment may not be as significant as if you are zinc or selenium deficient, but 20% is nothing to scoff at. And given that your thyroid has a direct impact on your gut health through its impact on peristalsis and the production of stomach acid, there's a very high chance that you aren't creating as much T3 as you could in your gut. This also means that improving your gut is one quick way to improve your T3 status. But how do you do that? There are many ways, but my preferred way is by changing your diet. If you follow my dietary recommendations, then you will not only improve your thyroid in the process, but you'll also improve your gut health as well. This strategy works because as you improve your thyroid, you will naturally improve your gut health which will naturally improve how many minerals and nutrients you absorb, which increases your thyroid, which then increases your gut, and this cycle continues onward. But there will always be some people who need more than just dietary changes in the form of things like supplements, probiotics, prebiotics, and even antibiotics in some cases. No matter what though, changing your diet is always the first step and does provide plenty of benefits to most patients who do it. The number three thing that you want to do is look to reduce your reverse T3. If this is the first time you're hearing about reverse T3, let me fill you in on some basics. Reverse T3 is considered an anti-thyroid metabolite that competes for T3 binding. The more reverse T3 you have in your body, the less effective T3 will be. So if you want to banish your low thyroid symptoms, you want your free T3 to be as high as possible and your reverse T3 to be as low as possible. It just so happens that because of the way the body works, if you increase free T3, you will automatically decrease reverse T3. But the reverse is also true. 
If your reverse T3 is high, then you know your free T3 level is impaired. For most people, just keeping an eye on their reverse T3 is sufficient. And you can do this by ordering a simple lab test called reverse T3. As far as interpretation goes, you want that reverse T3 to be less than 15 nanograms per deciliter. Anything higher than this value sends a signal to you that your body is probably preferentially creating reverse T3 instead of the alternative, which is free T3. The good news is you can push down that reverse T3 level with a few simple treatments. One of those is the use of T3-only thyroid medications like Cytomel or Lyothyronine. Nothing is more effective at reducing reverse T3 than these medications. The only problem is they can be difficult to obtain in some instances. But if you have access to them and your reverse T3 is sky high, taking them for even a short period of time can drive that reverse T3 down rather quickly. The second thing you can do is take advantage of intermediate intensity exercise. Research shows that you can improve your T3 level by tweaking how intensely you exercise. If your intensity is too high, it can actually drive down T3 levels. And if your exercise intensity isn't high enough, it will just have no benefit. For optimal T3 function, you want your heart rate to be about 50 to 70% of its maximum. This is the ideal range for improving your T3 status. And it just so happens to fall in that intermediate zone. The third thing that you can do to drive your reverse T3 down is eat enough calories. Calorie restriction is a powerful signal that is sent to the body to increase reverse T3. But you can completely fight this problem by just eating enough. It sounds simple, but many thyroid patients don't eat enough calories because they're trying to lose weight. But unfortunately, this calorie restriction only serves to hurt their thyroid function in the long term. Your next step, number four, is to check your liver. Remember when I told you that about 20% of your T3 is activated in your gut? Well, even more is activated and converted in your liver, and I mean a lot more. Some estimates put it as high as 60%. This makes your liver the most important organ for optimizing T3 status. And unfortunately, liver dysfunction is very common among thyroid patients. Research indicates that about 20 to 50% of thyroid patients have some degree of liver dysfunction in the form of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Compared to the average population, which is about 25 to 30 percent, this is almost 20 percent higher. And this dysfunction in the liver absolutely impacts thyroid health. What makes this condition even more sinister is that many people who have it have no idea that they do. This means that if you're listening to this right now, there's a very high chance that you have some element of fatty liver disease and you may not even realize it. But you can easily test for this problem with some simple liver function tests. These tests assess for liver enzymes, which can be found in the blood, and if these are present and in a high amount, they indicate some degree of liver damage. As a thyroid patient, it's critical to keep an eye on your liver function, just like you keep an eye on your thyroid function. So the next time you get your thyroid tested, make sure you are also testing your liver. The two tests that you want to get are AST and ALT. For optimal T3 status, you want both of these values to be less than 20. If you find that they are higher than this, then the underlying cause is most likely insulin resistance. And just like gut health, if you follow my dietary recommendations, that will automatically help reduce insulin resistance, which should naturally improve your liver. To give you an idea of just how important optimizing your liver is, you should know that if you were to fix your liver function, you will probably see the biggest benefit in your T3 level compared to doing anything else on this list. Number five is to check your iron as well as your ferritin. Iron deficiency is a problem that you may not connect to your T3 status, but it's more important than you probably realize. Inside of your thyroid, the enzyme thyroid peroxidase uses iron as a cofactor to function. If you don't have enough iron, then your ability to create both T4 and T3 will be compromised. While it is true that iron deficiency may not be as common as something like zinc deficiency or selenium deficiency, it's still important because it's something that is often missed by many doctors. To make matters worse, you don't have to be grossly deficient in iron in order to see a negative impact on your thyroid. So it may very well be the case that you're walking around with a low normal iron, which doesn't get flagged as low on your lab test, but is sufficiently low to negatively impact your T3 level. You can test for both of these by ordering a serum iron level and a serum ferritin. Your serum iron tells you how much iron is available in your bloodstream, and your ferritin is used as a marker of iron storage across the entire body. A common scenario that I see among thyroid patients is one where their serum iron is normal, however their serum ferritin is lower than it should be. But just having this low ferritin or suboptimal ferritin is enough to reduce your T3 level. For optimal T3 levels, you want your serum ferritin to be around 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. If you find that either are low, you can often replace them by using some simple iron over-the-counter supplements. But a word of warning, do not use iron unless you have a documented deficiency. 
Taking more than you need can make your thyroid worse, so only use it if you need it. Number six on the list is to take an adaptogen. These natural botanical-based compounds help your body adapt to and manage stress. And as far as your thyroid is concerned, stress is a killer of T3. The more stress that you are under, the more cortisol that will be released from your adrenal glands. And if released in excessive amounts, cortisol can blunt T4 to T3 conversion, thereby leading to low T3. Adrenal adaptogens like maca root or ashwagandha or rhodiola can help fight this problem by normalizing cortisol. A little bit of stress is actually healthy, but you can tell if your stress is starting to negatively impact your T3 level by looking for these symptoms. Fatigue even after a good night's rest, the sensation of feeling wired but tired, reliance upon caffeine and sugar as a source of energy, and both high and low energies at the wrong time of the day. If you have any of these symptoms, then it's probably time to consider taking an adaptogen. Each adaptogen has a slightly different benefit, so you can match your adaptogen to your symptoms. For instance, maca root will not only help with energy and vitality, but also sex drive and libido. Ashwagandha, on the other hand, is great for low energy, but also for weight loss. And rhodiola is good for energy, but also for mood and cognition. Number seven is to take iodine. The topic of iodine is always controversial, but it doesn't have to be. Here's what we know about iodine and T3. Because iodine forms an essential component of the T3 thyroid hormone, iodine deficiency impairs its production. In terms of magnitude, this one is huge. You can kind of get by with a suboptimal level of zinc and selenium, but the same is not true for iodine. If you don't have enough iodine, you will feel it and you will experience major symptoms. Whether it's a physical change to the size of your thyroid gland, which it can actually enlarge, causing a goiter, or a gross decline in thyroid hormone production leading to hypothyroidism, iodine deficiency is not going unnoticed. So the real question is less about whether or not iodine is important for your T3 status, and more about whether or not you should be taking more of it. And unfortunately, the data is about as clear as mud. So instead of diving into the controversies of iodine intake, here's what I can tell you. Research has shown that iodine intake in the range of 150 micrograms to 300 micrograms is quite safe. And taking iodine within this range range will ensure that your thyroid has what it needs to create enough T3. And if you're taking it within this tight range, you will reduce your risk of iodine-induced problems like Hashimoto's or Graves' disease. It is true, though, that some people do feel better when taking higher doses of iodine. But I would caution against this approach as the pros do not always outweigh the cons. Likewise, it is also true that some people do see a benefit to their T3 level by completely avoiding iodine. But this only works if you were previously taking more than you needed. And this is a big assumption, so don't do this unless you know for sure that's the case. As far as pretty much everyone else is concerned, you will not see a problem if you take your iodine in the range of 150 to 300 micrograms per day. And in my opinion, the best way to do this is with an iodine supplement because foods vary quite dramatically in their iodine content. Some people get upset because I spend a lot of time talking about the natural ways to improve T3 levels. But you should know that you can increase your T3 level by simply taking a prescription medication. But there's a reason why I focus more on the natural options. The natural way is always preferred because it allows your body to create more of the T3 that it needs on its own, as opposed to taking a T3 medication, which will temporarily shut down your body's capacity for producing its own T3. It's not that taking T3 thyroid medications themselves can be dangerous or harmful, but like any medication, they do carry some risks. So why wouldn't you at least entertain the natural option before jumping into the prescription option? That's my own personal philosophy, but you can do whatever you think is best. By the way, if you're somebody who likes the idea of taking control of your thyroid the natural way, then I'd recommend checking out this video next.